you so much. First of all, let me say it's nothing short of a miracle that both Madhvi and I have made it. And we have sadly lost our third speaker along the way because of some ridiculous traffic conditions that have taken place uh, in Bandra today, right? So Parmesh won't be able to join us, but we are very, very happy to have you, Madhvi. Thank you because the session is based on your book, yeah, thank The you. Laws of Desire. Yeah. Thank you, Bishak. And I was just going to echo you. It's been a, an act of pure love getting here, I think, because we would, I would have given up a long time ago. We were stuck 2.2 kilometers away for the last hour and a half. And, you know, the last, I'm from Delhi, the last two days we were waxing lyrical about Bombay, how fabulous it is, oh, the sea, oh, how wonderful, how, how fantastic. And today it's like, hmm, I think some of those might need to be revised. But it's lovely to be here and lovely to be talking to all of you. So thank you. Yes, and on that note, as a hardcore Mumbaiite, I basically <laughs> jumped on a train from Mahim to Bandra, begged an auto rickshaw guy who runs a shared auto and said, please take me, I'll give you the whole amount, and somehow <laughs> made it here, yeah. So really quite, uh, yeah, so I'm a little frazzled, I must confess, yeah, a little fragmented, but let's hope, yeah. Okay, so... First of all, let me just say this is really one of the most delightful non-fiction books that I've ever read and very elegant in its structure and I'm just going to read the contents. So the contents are just six words. Preamble, chapter one is criminal, chapter two is immoral, chapter three is obscene, then unnatural and then amendment. So it sort of, you know, signifies the value of words and writing as we think about the law, desire and love. And to start off, um, Madhvi, I wanted to actually uh, ask you why you decided. What was your motivation in sort of tying these two things together, right? Law and desire. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, my, my mother always used to say that uh, she thought I would become a lawyer since I don't listen to anybody else's point of view. Uh, and here I am in conversation with someone who runs a, uh, an outfit called Point of View. So, um, I've always loved the law. Mm. I'm not a lawyer. Someone just asked me before the session whether I was. I'm not. Maybe in another life I would have been. Uh, but my interest in the law is because it's impossible to think about sexuality outside yeah. the law. Um, and, and of course, we can think about the formal law and informal laws. There are many ways in which there are social laws that are not codified. Uh, but I'd like to argue that actually the formal law is very cognizant of the uncodified laws as well and takes them on board when it's, when it's coming up with its own letter. So I've always been fascinated by what it is that um, defines desire. What it is that sort of constrains desire, what it is that creates desire. Um, and if we, and since we can't think about sexuality outside certain kinds of definitions, yeah. and the law provides us with those definitions, it seemed to me very useful to think about law and desire together. Not necessarily because I wanted answers, I'm not the kind of person who likes answers, but precisely because I wanted to sort of uh, expose, shall we say, the number of questions that go unanswered sure. in the letter of the law and in the spirit of the law, right? How many times we actually do not question the assumptions about desire that the law makes when it is coming up with its dictates? Absolutely. And I think on that note, the book begins by asking a number of questions, which yeah. I'm going to read out. Can a woman choose whom to marry if her father disapproves of the match? Does sex remain sex when it becomes work? Can a man become a woman because he feels like one? Is it the law's task to ensure heterosexuality? Does reproduction need to be regulated? And going beyond this, I think what uh, Madhvi says is that, how does the law appear when looked at from the vantage point of desire? So Madhvi, I'm just throwing that question yeah. at you. How does it look? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, and as you know, Bishak, I see this also in my introduction. It's actually so commonsensical, right? There are so many laws 
for instance, let's take a specific example, right? So the extremely progressive, what's now known as the NALSA judgment, uh, which gave a, a conferred a lot of rights on what is now called the third gender demographic in India, um, and many, many sort of welcome observations about what constitutes gender, what constitutes sexuality, and maybe we'll talk about those later. But there's actually just a fundamental question, right? Mm -hmm. The judgment conferred lots of rights, civil rights, on third gender people. But the question that no one thinks to ask is, why should the law care what my gender is before I can get a ration card? Mm. Yeah. Why should the law care whether I identify as male or female or neither or both in order to allow me to buy kerosene at government cost? So we are so busy celebrating our victories in, in legal judgments uh, we actually forget to ask the question of why are we being subjected to legal judgments in the first place. Mm. So those are some of the sort of fundamental basic questions that I think we do not think to ask because we've been so hemmed in to a world in which we are told quite condescendingly, well, if the judgment goes in your favor, then you will get rights X, Y, and Z. And it's like, but as a citizen of a country, why shouldn't I get those rights without conforming to any one of those structures the government lays out for us. So th in many ways, my book is, and that's why I said I'm not a lawyer, my book is, is sort of asking those commonsensical questions uh, that would in many ways um, circumvent the need for the law and actually sidestep the law rather than engaging with it and saying, but you need to sort of change this clause over here. It's like, why do you need to legislate on my bodily yeah. um, contours? No, that's actually one of the things that struck me is that sometimes when you're not a lawyer but you're interested in the law, you are able to dig much deeper, right? And ask the questions that lawyers don't necessarily ask. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the things that really, yeah. I mean, I'm just smiling because um, the afterword or what is it called, the amendment of this book is about marriage and, you know, this is when we're talking about fiction, we talk about spoiler alert. So my spoiler alert for this, even though it's not fiction, uh, is that the entire amendment is a plea against marriage to sort of abolish marriage. Um, and this is very much going in the face of a, of a huge tide, tidal wave in favor of marriage now. And we can talk about more about that later. But I wrote a little piece on this for this wonderful publication called Article 14. And Priya Ramani, who is one of the editors, also wonderful, wonderful journalist and legal mind, wrote to me asking me a set of questions saying, you know, and so what do we do with this? What do we do with that? And I said, Priya, um, I'm just asking the question of why marriage? And she wrote back right away and said, I'm so sorry for thinking like a lawyer <laughs> and not just thinking. And, and so she said, you know, yes, you have to ask the question and then we can come up with yeah solutions later on or whatever it is, but you have to be able to ask the question. So I think in this book, that's really all I've done, is yeah. just ask the question. And you know, together we can think about answers or not, uh, but that was not the role of my book. No, totally, and I think again, you know, uh, the law for people who are not lawyers can also be an intimidating space. So sometimes even if you're thinking the questions in your head, yeah. You're like, oh my God, does this question really make sense? But since we were talking about Priya Ramani, one of the examples I was really struck by is actually the one that you give about her case versus uh, MJ Akbar, right? right? Which we again celebrated very yeah. widely. And Madhvi, maybe you can talk a little about what you, you know, found about sort of the judgment, right? Whether it's really as... Liberating. Yeah, as yeah. we sort of, you know, thought of it as. I mean, Bishaka, this is so... We're in a very terrible moment right now, historically, right? There were, there were the good old days when we knew exactly whose side we were on, who we were allied with, what causes we were supporting, and who or what we were against. And now there's all this sort of confusion, so even a good judgment actually has this underbelly and the seamy side that we can't really celebrate. And so the judgment that, um, that Bishakha is referring to just came out early last year, 2021, uh, a case against uh, MJ Akbar, former editor of you know, various publications, a brilliant journalist. He was my editor when I was um, at Asian Age as well. Um, and it was, he had brought a case of defamation 
against Priya Ramani for filing, for, for naming him in as a sexual harasser or as a sexual predator. And the court found in her favor, which I think is an excellent judgment, because uh, uh, the idea is that women should feel free to speak uh, about things that they've been encouraged not to speak about. And this was a moment where, and this is another interesting thing that I hope we'll talk about, this was a moment in which the court said, actually, what happened to you in the privacy of a room was actually of public importance and public interest. So the fact that you wrote about it in public is a good thing. So it was a good judgment in terms of that kind of, or that version of a feminist angle. But when you read the judgment, and this is what is so scary, the judge actually exonerates Priya by saying, um, women should not have to live with the shame, quote unquote, capital T, capital S, as though it's the weather or something of the kind, right? Women should not have to live with the shame. And in fact, in order to uh, think about an India in which the shame does not attach to women, we need to go back to the epics of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, uh, which is surprising since perhaps the Mahabharata may be a little bit more, but the Ramayana is certainly not known for empowering women. Um, and his example is that we need to uh, go back to that section in the Ramayana where uh, Lakshman is asked, what does Sita look like after she has been kidnapped? And he says, I don't know what she looks like because I never looked past her feet. And the judge is quoting this anecdote as an example of how much respect men in the Indian past used to pay to women that they would never even look at their face. And quite forgetting, of course, that this is the same Lakshman who literally hems in the woman by drawing a circle and saying, you cannot stray beyond this point, who will not look at Sita's face because she is the property of his brother, not because he doesn't want to. And in fact, there are several versions of the Ramayana uh, that's, that talk about Lakshman's uh, desire uh, for Sita in really sort of, uh, you know, very radical ways. So for the judge to bolster a judgment that can be termed a feminist judgment, by taking recourse to stories that are anything but feminist, talking back to the Ramayana in a judgment against a Muslim man, to me strikes me as a deeply problematic judgment. So now what do we do with this? Do we celebrate it or do we criticize it? Clearly the answer is we have to do both, that we cannot do just the one and the other, but we have to have that kind of critical eye to bring to bear on this and rather than just sort of simply saying this is a wonderful judgment, to say, well, what are the terms within which this judgment is setting itself, right? What is the space that the judgment is clearing? And more crucially, what is the space that it's shutting down? And it is that, that those are the questions that we have to ask. Yeah, and that's exactly what struck me, right? That going below the law yeah. and sort of digging out or excavating sort of deeper questions yeah. around the logic on which these judgments right. are built, right? Uh, before going further, Madhvi, would you like to read a little bit maybe from the, um, you know, yeah. Sure. Um, you Bishak, want me to hold your mic? Uh, no, I think I'll be okay. <laughs> Bishak is very keen that I read and she just sort of told me this two minutes ago. So uh, we'll see if, you know, if this makes sense. But she wants me to read from the introduction, which is, you know, a good idea since it introduces. Um, and I, th I think I've talked about, I've just finished talking uh, in the previous page. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I've just finished talking in the previous page about how uh, the law both represses and enables because uh, it represses because it forces us to identify in certain ways. And this is one of the... Um, uh, the big sort of blind spots, right? We, we think that if the law recognizes us, that means a certain kind of freedom. But as I say, uh, visibility also means being policed much more. And in fact, being visible might not be the kind of liberation we might be hoping for. Um, and, so, and, and so I talk about that and then I come to this passage that uh, Bishaka... Listen, let me read. hold this. The minute I have my glasses on, I'll be fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. So this is why Lord wants desire to be categorized, because desire poses the biggest threat to the rule of law. By sneaking past social constraints of caste and religion and gender and orientation, desire threatens to unravel the social fabric itself. Law wants to maintain the status quo, while desire can overturn hierarchies. 
The law protects social structure, while desire threatens to undo it. Even the simplest possible question posed from the vantage point of desire has the ability to upset social categorization. And this is where I talk about the NALSA judgment. And so I'm going to skip that for now. But there is hope yet. Despite the law's delight in definition, it is riddled with caveats and exceptions. It is not enforceable in any uniform manner, and petitions can result in drastically different judgments. The law is thus less rigid than it pretends to be, because its fundamental activity is that of interpretation. Equally, desire is often more acquiescent than we might like it to be. Under pressure, it disavows multiplicity in order to inhabit straight-jacketed categories sanctioned by the state. Desire can thus appear to be legally dutiful despite its unruliness, while the law can in fact be more chaotic than the rigidity of its demeanor. Such are the paradoxes of law and desire that this book will explore. Law defines the social while desire threatens to disrupt it. The law of desire is therefore both a necessity and an impossibility. This is exactly why I wanted you to read it, because it's <laughs> expressed very, very nicely. Thank you. So, you know, again, just moving this forward a little bit, if we talk about sort of sexual subjects, right? Yeah. Or if we talk about whose desire, Madhvi, you know, would you say, like, how does the law look at desire through the lens of identity or who is the subject of desire? Is everybody's desire considered legitimate by law? Yeah. Um, I mean, clearly, no, no and no yeah. one knows this answer better than you, Bishaka. So, I, absolutely, right? And, and I, so I take your question as an invitation yeah. to meditate on that a little bit. Um, the law is fascinating. I mean, it really is. Uh, it's fascinating m a lot because of the lies that it tells about itself. Right? So the most common and iconic emblem of the law is of a blindfolded image holding the scales of justice. The blindfold is meant to signify pure objectivity. You're not taking anyone's side in coming up with the law. I mean, that is perhaps the biggest piece of yeah. fiction, uh, you know, spoiler alert, it's the biggest piece of fiction that you can have because the law comes from somewhere. It speaks for certain groups of people. If other groups want the law to speak for them, they have to fight for it. The law is not, biased, is not impartial, it is very biased. Right? Yeah. And so speaking in terms of desire or in terms of sexuality, there is no question that the laws as written before various amendments, and no matter how well-intentioned they might have been, are written from the perspective of enabling a certain kind of heterosexual dispensation yes. that will favor the man over the woman, without doubt, without question. That is the fundamental template on which all laws of desire and sexuality are created. Now, you can certainly say, and so for instance, you know, 2018 was this golden year of judgments in, in India, at least in relation to sexuality. And one of the golden judgments, aptly named Joseph Shine, um, which Sean was about adultery. Right? Um, and the adultery judgment uh, said for, very briefly uh, that women too can be adulterers, right? The law yeah. had been written from the perspective of, uh, sorry, that men too can be adulterers. The law had been written from the perspective of the man. The woman is the only one who can cheat on the husband. And um, the husband has a certain right to, you know, uh, ask for a divorce if the woman has uh, cheated on him. Uh, and the law says we've got to remove the gender here. If any partner in a marriage has an affair outside marriage, and that should be grounds enough for divorce, that should be uh, termed adultery no matter what, right? Um, and it's a, again, it's a good judgment. Again, it's a judgment that aims to towards gender neutrality, where there was a clear bias towards men. But again, it, it was it was to my mind very problematic because it didn't understand that the very word adultery it's, yeah. Yeah. applies only to women. The very word adulterate, I mean, you know, when you think about it etymologically, it's about muddying the bloodline. And remember, everyone says, right, you always know who your mother is, but you don't know your, who your father is, which is why the suspicion, endless sexual suspicion of women 
who have they sort of who are they having their children by and this notion is it's only the woman who is capable of adulteration right the man will pass on his genes wherever it is but it's only the woman who can be guilty of adultery and so the the law completely ignores that and remember these are not uh, stupid people on the bench they are highly educated um highly uh, sort of aware people who hopefully read a lot of literature before they write their judgments but it's also an extremely male court i'm only talking about the supreme court right now right extremely male and so even when say justice chandrachud then who is now chief justice of india one of the most progressive judges i have seen in recent times in the supreme court um will nonetheless completely be unaware and unwilling to think about the misogynistic angle of the very word adultery right and also just to sort of take you know and and so then the entire idea becomes how do we protect women from a law that has been biased against them now for me the language of protection is equally problematic the idea and and protection comes up in every single bill aimed for women allegedly or at women and for me protection is such a double edged sword right women are not allowed to go out of the house after dark for our protection we are told not to work for our protection we are told not to travel in crowded buses for our own safety it's like what price safety what price protection and so to take that word and to use it as a signal for a, a progressive judgment is to my mind really problematic and so there are ways in which laws are not made for women laws are not made for non married non reproductive heterosexuals right if you take the surrogacy bill for instance it just a travesty uh, the then um, woman um, a home minister saying uh, a woman has a responsibility to bear a child for her male brethren um, because then you keep it all in the family and you cannot pay her for it because a woman's body is of course to be used or put in the service of men right and that's meant to be a a progressive okay, yeah. a progressive saying so the law is very biased but i find that attempts to correct the law do not in fact address questions of bias they just sort of want to add the word woman where the word man might have been earlier but they don't actually address the spirit uh, the spirit of the law so for instance and this is why i said politics is so much more complicated now the shabri mala judgment yeah again 2018 wonderful judgment again for those of you you know who might not know about this um this was this is a rule in shabrimala temple in kerala where women below the age of 50 or be between the ages of 10 and 50 which are considered menstruating years um women are not allowed to enter the temple through the front steps yes. uh there was a case brought which went all the way to the supreme court and the supreme court uh ruled unfortunately not a unanimous decision um that women should be allowed to enter that it's discriminatory for us to think about menstruating women as being you know untouchable women who cannot be near divinity cannot be in you know allowed into spaces occupied by men as well uh the one judge who ruled against this the one judge who said women should not be allowed was a woman So this is what I'm saying things are so complicated that here we say on the one hand that the judges are or the bench is largely male we should have more women and then you have the sole woman judge in that judgment saying menstruating women are dirty and should not be allowed into the temple what do we do with ourselves right what do we do with our lives it's really really difficult to actually come down uh, come when it comes down to the wire and say this is this is what we need if we have more women on the bench we will have sort of more representation and of course that's true to an extent but it doesn't necessarily mean more enlightened judgments yeah. and so that law now and the prime minister of the country went on record saying he will not allow that decision to be uh, that verdict to be implemented so women are still not allowed in shabrimala uh, temple despite the majority verdict of the supreme court so this is where law capital l law and small l laws also you know collide with yeah. one another they say it's custom not to allow this and custom is the usual go to right uh, you cannot decriminalize 377 because custom people are not ready for it and this is why justice murlidhar in in the delhi high court and justice shah in their judgment they said this wonderful thing about you know we have to look at what's called constitutional morality 
not the morality of two people walking on the road, which by the way, as I keep saying, people walking on the road actually don't care. You're just making them the scapegoats for your own phobia. And so the idea of saying the constitutional morality must be upheld, which is to say, you speak to the best practices rather than to the lowest common denominator that you use to justify your own bigotry. That's the kind of conversation we need to be having, not please include me in the law, right. right? The minute we sort of fall back into that kind of very narrow identity politics, we are losing the plot because we're not in fact building solidarities. We're not in fact saying, if you're not gonna count them, you're not gonna count me either. By rushing to try and get ahead of the queue and saying, please count me, all we're ensuring is that the door will be shut behind us rather than in front of us. And for me, the pressure we need to put on the law is that you will not shut that door on me or on anybody else. And if you're going to shut the door on anybody, you've got to shut it on all of us. Thanks. That, I think, is really, really helpful. In, yeah understanding this sort of tangled web and as you were talking about adultery actually I was thinking what a paradox it actually recognizes female desire outside of marriage on the one hand but the word itself is so prejudicial yeah. that it in the recognition sort of deems it exactly. a problem right exactly. so it's that kind of mm. double-edged sword so um, Madhvi now to go to sort of you know other categories of women maybe whose desire is, who are not deemed legitimate subjects in a yeah. sense, right? Mm -hmm. So say if we think about sex workers. Yeah. Sex workers are typically seen as objects of desire. Uh, and that itself, that whole gaze is so powerful that it kind of obliterates even the possibility of sex workers, right, having their own desires. And I think, again, if we look at the law, the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act is a very weird wording because trafficking is a crime. Yeah. It's not about morality, right? So I'm curious about if you have any thoughts about, um, right. you know, yeah. Right. And, I, you know, I, Bishaka, as many of you know, has made one of the most fabulous uh, films in relation to this. So, you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well about, about sex workers. Um, this is a t another tangled web. I'm sorry that I'm only giving you tangled webs today, uh, but there seem to be no other kinds. Um, the trouble with what's called prostitution, uh, which is a word that the British introduced to describe a whole gamut of sex workers, courtesans, devadasis, tawayafs. This was their blanket term. Actually, their term was uh, singing and dancing girls, that was their term. Uh, but then they also said, okay, what the hell, let's call them prostitutes, right? Um, and the British, you know, despite the fact that we speak their language, did not always have a way with words. Um, and so prostitution as defined legally by the law, which as you know is a colonial inheritance for us. And you mentioned ITPA, which is the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act from 1985. There was an act before that, from 1958, a nice sort of reversal of numbers, uh, called the Suppression of Immoral Traffic Act, whose acronym, which is what I find fascinating, is SITA. Right? <laughs> and I think that that was a deliberate acronym because it was supposed to hold up aspirationally the goal of purity to so-called fallen women, right? To say, sort of say, we will dig you out of your fallen state and make you aspire to the status of Sita. But this goes back, Pishaka, doesn't it, to the Ramani Akbar judgment and the judge there saying, let's all try and be like Sita, um, even though what he misses out then is that the reason Sita's fate in the Ramayana is what it is, is because she is suspected of sexual infidelity. Which is to say, the standard, gold standard of female sexual morality is only held up as a gold standard because in the text in which she is written, she's actually condemned for being the opposite of that. Mm. By men, of course, let me not, you know, let me not forget to add. So there's a way in which every time you mention morality, the whiff of immorality is not far away. Yeah. 
we only talk about morality because we're terrified of immorality. We only talk about uh, something sort of, you know, fallen women because we're so terrified that upright women will be infected, infected by this. So the entire notion of um, uh, suppression of immoral traffic act was about this idea of let's give you a gold standard towards which to aspire. As Bishaka said so rightly, the names of these acts, Sita and ITPA, Immoral Traffic Protection Act in 85, seem to be fairly value neutral. But what they do is a really sly, cunning operation, which is they conflate two things which are by no means the same. They conflate sex work and trafficking. So both these acts in line with the UN Convention outlaw and criminalize trafficking, absolutely. Yeah. The right thing to do, that's great. But what they do and the way the law is enforced is it conflates sex work with trafficking and says no woman would want to undertake sex as employment. Therefore, we will consider all sex workers as trafficked women. And so this becomes the reason then, but remember, and India's in a weird, interesting situation, right? We criminalize prostitution, but we do not criminalize prostitutes. Yeah. So you cannot actually arrest a woman for sex work, but the law is written in such a, I don't even know what word to use, cruel way and cold-blooded way that it criminalizes everything that a sex worker might do with the money that she earns. Yeah. So sex workers, like any, empl any employed people, use their money to look after their parents, look after their children, pay rent on their house, buy groceries. If she is caught spending her money from sex work to look after her aged parents, the parents can be arrested for living off the earnings of a sex worker. I mean, that's how cruel that law is, right? So we won't arrest the prostitute, but we'll arrest, we will arrest quite literally any movement that she can perform with the money that she earns, right? The other thing is, and this again goes back to that idea of the private and the public, sex work in public is criminalized, yeah. not in private. So if you are a high class sex worker with your own house and a car and a driver, great, go for it. But if you're poor and you need the money, and this is a gainful mode of employment for you, that's when the law will harass you. I mean, just see the ways in which the law is biased, not only towards men, but in terms of class, yes. in terms of caste. I mean, it's really quite shocking. And are you really telling me that the lawmakers had no idea that this was what the impact of the law was going to be? So that idea of criminalizing sex work to me is deeply problematic. And if you think about this from um, the perspective of desire, which is, of course, the perspective I'm coming at it from. The reason why sex work, well, there are two reasons why sex work is viewed with such horror. One is economic, one is moral, right? The economic horror is because this is one avenue in which women can be completely financially independent yeah. without depending on a man, man to own her, right? So she's not the wife of a husband or a sister of a brother or a daughter of a father, anything. There is no legal right there. And in fact, we have historical records going back centuries in the subcontinent of uh, Tawayaf's Devadasis being among the richest people in the city. Uh, Veena Oldenburg has uh, uh, tax records from Lucknow that says that the Tawayafs were the highest taxpayers in Lucknow. Kautilya writes in the Arthashastra about prostitutes and how much they are paid by the state. They are government servants because they're performing a job that the government recognizes is a job, right? So we have many centuries of history in which morality was not attached to it and which economics was a gainful outlet for them, right? So there's an economic horror that we have about independent women in India today. The second thing, which is the moral horror, is that sex has been so privatized mm -hmm. more and more and more. And in fact, that's why I have a problem with all the judgments that use privacy in relation to sex as well. Sex has been so privatized that we think it, it is the most uh, hidden part of a self. It is the most hidden part of an individual. It is the most secret part of an individual. It is the most cherished part of an individual. And therefore, it should never be shared with anybody else because it defines that individual. 
If we think about sex as something that defines an individual, then anything that makes that definition more widespread is going to be seen in terms of morality as being immoral. If we think about sex as work, the question of morality does not arise, right? Because it is a crime, and this was what uh, homosexuality was described as well, it's a crime without a victim. So how can it be a crime? Who is the sex worker hurting? How do you criminalize that? Well, you criminalize that by making it immoral, which is why the act is called the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act. Right? When you say the core of yourself is sex, therefore you need to protect that, you're in the register of morality. The minute you say sex is work that you do in order to become an independent woman, that is something that's banned because, oh my God, how can women be economically independent? Well, thank you for teasing those apart, actually. That was really very, very enlightening, Madhvi. Yeah. The, uh, and you know, when, as you were speaking, two things occurred to me. One is looked at from the perspective of desire. The issue with sex work is that it caters so little to female desire and so much to male desire in the sense that by and large it's, you know, there are very, very few women who will basically like, in, you know, ask somebody, yeah, who will say, hey, I need to have pleasure and I don't want to get married, I don't want to be in a relationship, right? And why can't I just pay somebody to come and pleasure me, right? So it's that very skewed kind of situation where we almost normalize male desire in thinking about it. The other thing um, that I wanted to actually ask you, now that we've sort of got even deeper into the tangled web, and then we'll open it up for questions and then, you know, sort of come back to, I think we have 20 minutes left, is actually about obscenity. So that's another of those concepts. And uh, one of my few entanglements with the law and desire has actually been to do a study around two sections of the Information Technology Act, which look at obscenity in digital spaces. Right. So one is what's called the obscenity provision, and one is what's called the consent provision. Right. And what we found actually very briefly is that you know when people circulate images without consent, intimate images, which is like almost a characteristic of the right. digital age, the offense in this case, or the harm, is actually a violation of consent. And there is a provision for it in the law, in the IT Act. But the law, uh, the police inevitably classify that as an obscene image, you know, thereby indicting the creator also, right? It's like saying, hey, you created an obscene image. So it's kind of indirectly that morality yeah. thing is creeping in, right? Um, and so there are very, very few intimate images which go under section 66E or the non-consensual circulation and most of them go under section 67. So again, the law is also in doing this, shaping our understanding of obscenity, images, sexuality, all of it, right? And I noticed you had a chapter on obscenity, so I'm also curious to... Uh, know what you found in that chapter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, obscenity, it's actually amazing to me that we think of the law as being um, defined and strict. If you read the law, you'll find that they actually, not that they don't have a clue what they're talking about, but it's like the dictionary, right? You go to the dictionary to look for a word, and they'll say, go here, here, and here, right? This word is like this, this, and this. And so you're just sent off on other tangents when you're looking for a definition. The law is like that, and obscenity is one of those terms in the law that is never defined. Mm. So 292 and 294, the IPC, is obscenity. The classic statement on obscenity, which judges and jurisdictions around the world adopt, a US judge's statement, and you know this, when he was asked what is obscenity, he says, well, I'll know it when I see it. Mm. That's the legal understanding of obscenity. Can you imagine? Anything more subjective and left open to the whims and fancies of the uh, adjudicating judge, I'll know it when I see it, right? 
And so you have all these cases under 292, 294, which completely defend, depend on the whim of the individual judge. So for instance, if you take the absolutely horrific and tragic case of MF Hussain, and what happened to Hussein, and how, you know, this was a real, real well-plotted conspiracy. There were cases filed against him on obscenity in different parts of the country, ensuring that this old man would have to go to different states for different hearings, finally all gathered together, come before um, uh, the Delhi High Court in, in Delhi, and Justice Call says, this is ridiculous, I am going to exonerate you. That came too late. It came four years before M.F. Hussain's death. He had already fled the country for fear of violence against his life, right? So that's, that's the power of the obscenity law, that it can be wielded by lower courts and people in a way that gives you very little recourse because the judge will say, well, it looks obscene to me. And again, justice calls judgment in favor of Hussain, which is a wonderful judgment, but again, it depended on his whim. He said, it doesn't look obscene to me. Now, how is that better than saying it looks obscene to me as a matter of principle? You cannot have laws like that. And the obscenity law is drenched with that kind of whimsicality from start to finish. You can notice certain trends, right? So there's no definition. There are certain trends, which is to say obscenity is overwhelmingly used against minorities overwhelmingly used against Muslims, against Dalits, against women, overwhelmingly. And inevitably obscenity because the eye of the judge is the sort of male judge sitting there. You see it in all these places. It is overwhelmingly anti-poor. So in fact, the books that are considered obscene inevitably tend to be the sort of pulp pornographic fiction that you can get on the roadside, right? That people read in order to sort of get their thrills. Those will be labeled obscene. The most famous sort of English text that the Indian Bombay High Court actually held to be obscene was Lady Chatterley's Lover. And the reason it held it to be obscene is because that talks about a cross-class relationship. It's like, oh my God, we cannot even allow a book that talks about crossing class, right? So obscenity is a very, very specific pro-status quo law that will not, that does not even think it needs to give us any basis for how whimsical it is, right? So you find a lot of the artists, the books, the films that are censored will inevitably, you know, think about lipstick under my burqa, my God, it offended on two counts, right? Burqa and lipstick, like women, how can you talk about that? And in fact, the censor board said, it, it, it talks too much about fantasy, about women's fantasy, as though that's a crime. But as Bishaka says, in fact, that is a crime, right? And that's, that's the world we're living in now, where the idea of fantasy is itself criminalized, especially when that fantasy is the product of minds that are not pro-status quo. And that becomes, to my mind, the scariest part about the obscenity laws. No, and I think also what's interesting is, you know, we are seeing sort of a... a I've forgotten the word, but we are basically exactly what happened a hundred years ago when the printing press yes. right, came into being and right. Charu Gupta writes about that. The anxiety was that explicit or erotic material yeah. would become available to the masses. Yeah, to the masses. And now we have the internet and it's exactly the same exactly. anxiety, right? That's right. Yeah. And even, you know, even uh, Charu's work on the sort of pulp fiction is so fabulous. Uh, and you have the immediate corollary even with performances, right? So you have a high class performance, uh, a cabaret, that's fine. But if you go and there, the, God, these judgments, many of them are unreadable. But if you can wade through them, I promise you, they will give you gems, not of the good kind. <laughs> but they say things like these people pushing together to see some cheap action yeah, yeah, yeah. that is obscene. How do you talk like this? Yeah. How do you write like this in a legal judgment? There's no shame. I mean, they, they don't feel any shame yeah. whatsoever in writing like this. But that's the kind of judgment that you see. And a real discomfort with desire at the heart of it, right? Absolutely. That's what it shows. Yeah. Okay, now we have time for questions from the audience. So, Chitra, you have a should I give you? Ah, there's a mic there. Super. Yeah. Great. Uh, first of all, I'm very 
first of all uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, since i agree 100% with whatever you say maybe 200% but <laughs> i don't really have a question about that uh, it's a very small question i agreed when you mentioned that the word immorality or adultery the words themselves were yeah. wrong no, mm. wrong is it kind of wrong okay yeah. what i want to ask is only one thing uh because when i talk to lots of uh, male and female lawyers in my family and in various ways we discuss all these sure. things uh, so that time we have been told that uh, you know sometimes a judgment uh is according to what uh the petition is i'm a, uh, i right. may go wrong right 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 uh, yeah okay uh, so you you go a little here and there but not really you just have to go sure. according to that sure now right. having heard this for years i want to ask you do you know of any uh, judgments or uh, uh, people have tried to question this yeah. legally these words themselves that they should be changed from the uh, right. either yeah. the law uh you know that's what it's a great question chitra i don't have an answer to that but i do have what your question reminded me of just a couple of thoughts i'd like to share the most recent example of what you're talking about and it's very important uh was the hijab judgment in the supreme court where um and again uh, to my mind a real travesty of justice um and the dissenting judge there says that the terms of the petition were incorrect because the petition filed its petition on the basis saying the hijab is what they call an essential practice of religion and so the judges who ruled against them went to town saying it's not essential essential none of their business but whatever that's what they ruled on and the dissenting judge says well that was the not the right way to phrase it the right way to phrase it diversity um uh, secularism people should be allowed to we are you know in, encouraging women to go to school that's it period case shot so yes there are judgments can we ask whoever to yeah that there are judgments that are hemmed in by the language of the petition itself there's no doubt about it another favorite example is the 377 judgment right where again and and this was this was you know something that i've had several conversations with my lawyer friends about as well remember 377 is um does not specify individuals right it says carnal acts against the order of nature, nature. Yeah. which under the british used to be interpreted as non reproductive non heterosexual mm. reproductive sex everyone in this room has non reproductive sex otherwise the population in this country would be <laughs> much worse than it is right now so and you know and and the lawyer the lead lawyer in 377 is a good friend of mine and i asked him and i said why could you not point to that and rather than saying let's talk about homosexuality as though homosexuality should bear the burden of non reproductive sex why don't we say this is a law that affects all of us every single one of us right that in that case hearing in the supreme court a sitting judge of the supreme supreme court says in open court does anyone here know any homosexuals not a single person in court said a word a sitting judge of the supreme court i told you there's no shame involved in among the judiciary if the terms of the petition had been this affects you sir presumably heterosexual judge as much as it affects all of us that question could never have been asked you see so that is why you're absolutely right the way in which petitions are framed you have to start from there it's not only the judgments it's us as petitioners who have to sort of you know i talked about sita as the aspirational gold standard we must set the bar high for the judges and we must say to them here is our challenge to you will you be able to rise to the occasion we'll wait for the next question here it is yeah um, do you hear me Hi. Uh my question was about um when you spoke about the law that granted rights to third gender folks um you talked about how the visibility of the law that gives grants you rights 
um, on some level. That visibility yeah. also leads to policing. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to how the lack of visibility allows certain freedoms and maybe certain vulnerabilities and how visibility you know, is also a double-edged sword and kind of unpack that nuance. Yeah, thank you. I, I, each of these questions has been a huge question. It's like, you know, we could talk about that for hours, but thank you. I mean, both these are wonderful questions. I'll, I'll try and be brief about this because it's so counterintuitive, isn't it? We actually want to be legally recognized because somehow not being recognized makes us feel like second-class citizens or makes us feel uh, un quite literally unseen, unheard, un unconsidered. Several uh, generations of queer theorists, queer activists have said, uh, be careful what you wish for because if you were to get it, that's only going to lead to more and more conformity. So just to take a small example of the US itself, um, where the sort of fight for legalizing gay marriage became the fight, as opposed to addressing the host of other queer, trans, gay issues that people are facing. And it's like, really? You want marriage? to be the big thing that you aim for, but then that follows the logic of saying, we want you to recognize us. We don't care if the poor Mexican immigrant is left out behind us. We want you to recognize us, right? And that's the same trend in this country. The minute 377 was decriminalized in 2018, the trend now is to legalize gay marriage, exactly. which, is, which is a trend I you know, personally oppose because I oppose marriage, period. <laughs> I don't... I. People want marriage for the, because rights are associated with marriage. Yeah. We should all get rights regardless of whether we are married or not. Yes. So, but going on that path of marriage is the conservative path. And by conservative, I don't necessarily mean a political alignment. I mean the status quo path. It's what the state allows you. So that's where you want to go. And so that's one of, for my mind, to my mind, that's one of the real costs of visibility. Now, if you're not visible, and you know, again, I, I, I don't know how much, I think we all know this, but in some parts of our mind, we unknow it. We come from thousands of years in the entire Indic subcontinent of histories in which people have not had sexual identities. We all have unmarried uncles and aunts in our families who live with other men or other women, completely no questions asked. What do they gain by saying, I am gay or I am lesbian? What do they lose? I mean, I'm not, I'm not uh, yeah. even hoping to answer either question. I'm just saying, these are the questions we must address. Can we exist? Have we existed without labels? The answer is clearly yes. What do we gain with the label? What do we lose with the label? Clearly what we gain with the label is admission to a certain kind of Anglophone, um, US-centric identity politics. What do we lose with the label? We lose access to the layered nuances of desire that might change across time and space and place and that we do not allow for those changes if we affix one label to one person. So that's sort of my brief answer to your wonderful question. There's another, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think time-wise, this is probably the last question. Yeah. Uh, should obscenity be defined by law is a bigger question because it is on is one's time? perspective. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, it's what? It is on one's perspective, whether it is obscene or not. Then yeah. what do you feel about it? Yeah. I mean, I think our discussion made quite clear that, no, I don't. I don't think so. And it's not it's just me. I think the law also doesn't think so because they also don't have a definition. Exactly. Uh, so no, I don't think it should be. So maybe we can take another Yeah, quick if there's question. one last quick hand up. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Thank you so much, first of all, for all this conversation. Having said all that, what you mentioned about Section 377, still I would uh, like to take this opportunity to ask you, how do you envision, in your perspective, the future state of uh, Indian legal definition for same-sex marriage or Indian the legal defin de definition for same-sex marriage or the ecosystem associated with it in the society. 
Sorry, can you say more? In uh, the sense, there are, are a lot you of asking how do I think the law exactly. will define same-sex marriage? No. The law, how it will define same-sex marriage, and also probably what are the intricate impacts it would have associated with the different contexts that we are talking about. For example, uh, uh, just to quote an example, yeah. uh, there are a lot of Indian corporates are still uh, not ready for uh, the life insurance or the term insurance for a same-sex yeah. same partner yeah. under the context that there is no yeah. legal definition of a partner right. in the Indian law. Yeah. So such threads which are open, so how do you envision, I know there are a lot of uh, open conversations but your thoughts ma'am. Yeah, you. no I mean I think, uh, I think my thoughts on this are actually very clear. There is, you are absolutely right that it is a hugely intricate house of cards. Uh, that marriage supports. So if you don't get married, you can't have a child, you can't have insurance, you can't have inheritance. In, for the longest yeah. time, if you were a Hindu household, a single daughter, there's no inheritance rights, nothing, right? So it's a whole bunch of, interestingly, financial transactions more often than not, right? And my answer, I don't think it's simple, but I really think it at least addresses the root of the problem which is why should any of these be tied to marriage? Yeah. You can have a form, every corporate company can have a form saying who do you nominate as yeah. your partner? That's all there is to it. I mean, it's yeah. not rocket science, you know? So any company that says, oh, the law does not tell me you have this right, is just sort of being phobic and not being called on it, right? I think there are very easy fixes to this, but we first have to divorce, as it were, marriage from rights. Right? And only then can we start the conversation. Yeah. No, thanks so much. Thank you. I just want to say this is something that personally affects me. My partner, who's a man, and I can't get a home loan mm. together. So I had to take the home loan in my name for us to buy an apartment, which is now only in my name. Yeah. You know, and we are also older now, so we are thinking of the future, etc. So we've never wanted to get married and now we are like oh my god what are we supposed to do going forward and my financial advisor is like hey if you really want him to inherit get married so you know it's it's uh, it's exactly what she's saying why should rights and marriage be linked to each other your marital status right yeah, yeah. I think we could go on forever, Madhvi. But, but it's a <laughs> miracle, miracle that we were here at all, yeah, so yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank no, you. thank you so much. I think this has thank been you. unbelievably fantastic. Thank yeah. You. Thank yeah. You. yeah.